because God, we all live in different situations, different neighborhoods, apartment complexes. God, we live in different places and, and, and go experience life in different avenues. And Lord, whatever it is, we want to bring you to the place that we are at. So Lord, help us, help us to cause our world look a lot like heaven. So God, today we dedicate this time, our attention to you in Jesus' name. If you believe it, say amen. amen. All right. Whew. Well, today, um, I, I would love to dive into the word with you today. Um, now, you know, just, just, just kind of in preparation for this evening, I, I was kind of debating, all right, God, what are we going to talk about? What do you need for these people? What do we need to hear? And it's funny because this subject kept on coming up. I mean, on the radio, in conversation. I heard it here. I heard it there. I'm listening to a podcast, and all of a sudden, it's like, oh, okay, all right. So I, 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 I believe that today, if you're in this place, God has something specifically for you. So if you'll tune in and listen up, I believe that God has a word that he wants to change you through it. So um, I, I think... I think if you're in this place and you've ever felt insignificant, um, I've got good news for you. I know I've been in places in my life where I've thought, you know what, this needs to change, but I don't think I have the power to do it. I, I, felt, I felt maybe like, oh gosh, I, I've questioned my value. I've, I've questioned my ability to be the right person for this situation. I, I've been in places where I just didn't know if I could get it through. And if you've ever experienced something like that, then I think today's word might have something for you. Um, see, today I want to talk to you about the power of a name. Because God, God's called you to be people of the name. And this is what I mean. A name evokes different emotions. I mean, that's why you probably named your kid the, the name you did. That's why you named your dog the name you did. It's descriptive. Maybe it means something to you. Um, and, 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 and when we say names, a lot of times they're packaged with meaning. Um, I mean, think about, think about brand names, brand names, brand names, right? Um, uh, if, if I were to say the word in and out, it would evoke an emotion, a feeling with you. Maybe, maybe the word chick Phil A would begin to ruminate some type of spicy chicken goodness on your taste buds. Uh, if, if I was to say maybe something like Five Guys or Black Angus or, 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 or maybe I was to say like something like um, vegan food, it would do something to you in different ways. Words like Nike or words like Adidas or maybe words like Ferrari. All those names bring pictures, emotions, thoughts, desires that mean different things. I mean, the same things even with people's names. Billy Graham probably means something to you. Um, maybe Little Pump. Um, and, and that might make you think of a rapper or it might make you think of plumbing. I don't know. I mean, the, the, the name could make you think of two different things depending on where you're at, right? Um, or, or, I mean, even, even charged words like, like Hitler, Stalin. I mean, these names are packed with meaning depending on where you are, where you come from, and what they represent. So understanding the power in a name can do a lot for you, and not understanding, misunderstanding the power in a name can do a lot against you. Uh, let's do this. I want to take a look at three quick verses, and I want, to, I, I, I want to see what God's trying to tell us through this idea of the name. Um, Exodus 27. You may not know it, but I think you know it. Exodus 27. The Bible begins to, to communicate something to us. It says here in Exodus 27, it says, you, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. We all heard that. That's one of the big tens. Now, I don't know, if, just to be honest here, I know with me, um, this verse has always confused me because I've thought like, okay, don't take the name of the Lord your God in vain. That's next to one of some of the big ones, like don't murder. Don't do adultery, right? Idolatry, that's a bad one. And I think to myself, what is this? Like murder? Cussing? Is that like a comparable type of thing? And, and this is just me, just me being honest. I, you know, I, I mean, when I when, when growing up, reading this stuff, hearing this stuff, and I think, all right, God, um, if this is a big deal to you, then I guess I won't do it, right? So, and, and, but, but when we look at it that way, I wonder if there's something God's trying to tell us that, that means a little more than we think it does on surface. Watch, check this out, check this out. Okay, Matthew, 8, Matthew 28, 19, check this, check this out. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name, the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
Now we're starting to get a little interesting, okay? Um, because, because the way God is dealing with the name, his name begins to take a wider understanding when we look at these verses. Let's go, let's, let's even go one more further. Philippians 2, 9 through 11. Take, take a look at this. So that, it says, therefore, God has highly exalted him, that's Jesus. God has highly exalted Jesus and bestowed or given to him the name that is above every name. So that, so that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. These three verses kind of put this picture together of what God's trying to communicate when we think about his name. It's funny because um, Moses, right, he's trying to free all the slaves in Egypt, and he, Moses is kind of like, all right, God, what are we going to do? Um, I don't think Pharaoh likes me. How are we going to work this out? Uh, I'm not too sure how we should approach this. And God says, you know what? Just tell him my name. Just, just go in, tell him who he's dealing with, and tell him I'm coming after him. See what that does to him. It, it's funny because when you look at it this way, all of a sudden, this idea of the name means something. You know what, it, you, you know what it's like. If you've, ever, if you've ever been a kid and you were bullied at one time, and all of a sudden that kid's name is coming around, it begins to spark a little bit of fear inside of you. Oh, let's, let's go further here. Let's go further. We looked at these verses. What about you? Like you believe in Jesus. Chances are, if you're in this place, chances are you believe in Jesus. Chances are you may have accepted the Lord into your life. Chances are that maybe God has changed your life in a certain way. What, what about you? What about your name? Because when you, God loves to change names. When you decided to give your heart to the Lord, what did God do with you? He gave you a new name. Now, I mean, sure, you still may be Billy or Joan or whatever. But, but he gave you a new name. And that name is Christian. Yeah, right. <laughs> Christian. Christ. Ian, well, you know, yeah, Christ I am. I am. It, it, it means that you, all of the sudden, have some type of correlation with this person, Jesus Christ. Right. Your name changed. So maybe, just maybe, there's some type of interaction with these ideas. So if you're a Christian, and if God's name means something, what, is this, what does this idea of a name really represent? What is this idea of a name really? Because it's not just like, like you know, J-O-A-N, Joan, G-O-D, J-E-S-U-S. It's, it's not just that. It's, it means something. It's like, it means something. Because a name is representative of several things. It's representative of a person's reputation. Their name went before them, right? It's their reputation. It, it's, it's the story that people think about this person that tells them what they're like. It's a story that people know that tells them what this person is like. It's a reputation. The name, the name means something. It's a story that people know that tells you what they're like. The name, a name represents somebody's presence. They walked into the room. The presence marks, the name marks where his presence is. If his name is there, it means he's present there. Checking in. Presente. <laughs> the name means something. It, it marks his reputation, it marks his presence, it marks his authority. Yeah. And a person with authority means his words, their words have power to change things. It's not like strength necessarily. What it means is they have the ability to speak and things happen. You know, it's like boss walks in, the, walks in the office. Who's doing this? Who's doing that? Hey, Johnson, give me five photocopies. And Johnson does it because he speaks and something happens. Look, if you have kids, if you're a teacher at a school, if you have a dog, you understand what this means. You speak and nothing happens. <laughs> Get to bed. What did I tell you five minutes ago? Get to bed. Sit, sit. Don't pee there. You know, it's, 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 and that's just the kids, right? And, you know if you have authority or if you don't have authority because the words you say don't have weight. And you know 
what it's like when um, you hold the authority of somebody. You walk in there and say, the boss told me, and then they do it. Because they know that the boss finds out that, it, you, that he told him, he told them, that they didn't do it, then somebody's in trouble. It's authority. Jesus walks into town. Centurion comes up to him and says, my, my servant's sick. Jesus says, well, let's go, let's go get him healed. Centurion says, no, no, no. Just say the word. Authority. He spoke. Things changed. So what does this mean for you and me? Like, honestly. What is this? Because we, we understand these, this is what God does. But what does it really mean for you and me? How, does, how do all the pieces connect? Because if you've ever been in a place where, 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 where I've been in, where you've thought, gosh, I just can't make a difference. I just can't make any headway. Gosh, God, do people even listen to me? Do I, do I, do I even matter? These are the thoughts that go through, I don't know, at least, at least my head sometimes. And I think, is it really worth it? And when we begin to struggle with these ideas, with the insignificance of being one of seven to eight billion people on a planet that are here today, gone tomorrow, of the millions that have come, gone, and are forgotten, you, I don't know, maybe I'm just weird, but I begin to think like what what I just start going all Ecclesiastes on the stuff like what does it even matter it's all vapor Lord <laughs> but when you begin to recognize that it's not my name that matters because yeah. ain't nobody know or care about Richard Dean being away with a junior except maybe my mom and my dad you know like they like me a lot <laughs> But with the other 8 billion people in the world, who cares, right? Who cares? <laughs> oh, my wife, too, yeah. I, what? I, sorry, hon, sorry, hon. I'm nervous, I'm nervous. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, Lord. Who cares? But, but when you begin to get down into it, I, I don't have a rest of my name. I don't have to rest on the strength, the power, the ability that they have. God's grace is bigger than it because it transfers, it moves, it makes his name do things that I can't do. So what does it even matter? What does this name represent? If you really look at this idea, then you have to recognize that if, if, if God's name, if, if it represents who he is and his reputation, then I have to honor it. I have to honor God's name. What do we say in Exodus? That it said, do not take the Lord's name in vain. More than cussing, it's deeper than that. It's deeper than this. It's not just saying the GD word, which you probably shouldn't say, but just but work with me here. Let's go a level below. Let's go a step further. It's more than just the words that I say. It's the way I live my life. Do not take the Lord's name in vain. What happened the day you decided to give your heart to Jesus? You begin to change your name and you left your ways, your names behind, and you assumed, you you, you received received the name, you took the name of Jesus Christ as your own. You became a Christian. You took his name in to be a part of your life. You took it. You see, what does it mean? A reputation. It's the story that's told to others to tell them what that person's like. Think about God's reputation. I mean, he really cares about it. God does things for no other reason sometimes than just for his name's sake. His name goes out before him. His enemies, when they heard he was coming, what did they say? Oh, we know that guy. We heard the stories of what he did to the Egyptians. They began to shake in their boots because they knew when they heard the name, his reputation went forward, and all of a sudden they knew that their days were numbered because God's got a reputation. There's a way he wants to be known. But what happens when you take that name and you put it on? What happens when you take the name? Do you take that name in honor or do you take the name in vain? You see, this is, look, look we understand we're not going to earn our salvation. Okay, we understand we're not going to earn, this is, this, is, this is not about working to get God to like you. But what it is, is this is working and doing things a certain way to maintain that when people think about God, they think the right story. Because the way I live life tells a story about who I think God is. The words I say, the way I treat my employees, the way I treat my brother, my sister, my mom, my dad, the way I treat my children, the way I treat my classmates or professors, the way I treat my neighbors, it tells a story about what I believe in God and it affects the story that other people think about that God I say I love. What does it mean to take God's name in vain? It means I assume the name of Christian, of believer, of someone who loves God, and I don't regard it. I don't respect it. I don't make a reputation that's worthy of my Savior. Amen. 
no guilt, no guilt, no guilt, because we're all in the same boat together. But we've got to recognize this. What did, it, what, did, what did it say in Exodus? It says, if you take his name in vain, the Lord will not hold him guiltless, whoever takes this name in vain. What am I doing to God's good name? Because it's not just my reputation. It's the one that when they say, oh yeah, he goes to church. He goes to church. <laughs> oh yeah, I heard him praying. He listens to Christian music and stuff like that. Him? The, 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 the repair truck rolls up and it's got the little fish on the back of it. Oh, I think I need a different quote, <laughs> right? What, 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 what reputation, what story are you telling? You see, the, the story I tell dictates what others, whether they'll come to God or away from him. There's this verse in um, Romans and, and Paul the Apostle kind of begins to rip into them. Begins to say, guys, 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 get, get, get a clue. He says, remember, it's written that the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. When people knew that they were coming, they said, oh, that God, I don't gotta pay attention to him because they created a reputation that was unworthy of God. But when people think of you and your faith, are people blaspheming, disregarding God's name? Or, or are they praising, saying, you know what, I, I wanna be a part of that. Don't worry, the message is gonna get a lot funner in a minute. Don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. We, we, we just gotta start off here and we'll take off, don't worry. But it's written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. I, one of my favorite people in, in history is a fellow named William Booth. Um, not just because he had a really rad beard, um, but, but I love this man, William Booth, because of the impact he had on the world. Back in the 1800s, he lived, and he's the founder of the Salvation Army. Founder, foundation of the, founder of the Salvation Army, him and his wife were preaching machines. He was born in the poorest part of England to parents that didn't really give a rip about who God was. And he grew up in the hood, in the slums, and as a teenager, all of a sudden something happened in his life and he gave his heart to Jesus and everything began to change. He became known as the prophet to the poor. By the time he had died, and this is in the 1800s, mind you, he had traveled to six continents over five million miles and had preached 60,000 sermons. You do the math, because I'm not good at it. And this is the life he led. He didn't just preach the gospel, but he created programs for the poor that changed the society around him. This is how you know that you're telling the right story. Because people who don't agree with you will still respect you. Right? They, 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 don't, they don't have to be converted by you, but when they respect you because what you say is what you do, the God you represent is honorable. This is, this is what it means to have a story that honors God, that doesn't take his name in vain. William Booth, met with presidents, he met with kings and queens, he traveled the world, and at his funeral, at his funeral in England, um, by his casket, 150,000 people walked by. 150,000 people came to give respect to this man, William Booth. In his funeral service alone, 40,000 people came in to honor his life, including the Queen of England. This is what it means to have a name that takes, to, to take God's name in honor and not vain. I, I wonder, I wonder what story we're telling other people about God. If you live in fear, what story are you telling about God? If you're living, if, if you're living in a place where, where you're just, you know, live, live in the greasy grace life, you're, you're not living a, a life that honors the name of God. So we have to check ourselves and say, what story, what story am I telling? You see, the name means something. It represents God's reputation. But you see, it does something else too. It also begins to represent, it begins to represent um, this idea of his presence. This is really, this is really crazy. Um, when God wanted to be somewhere, he put his name in it. He put his name on somebody. In the temple, he put his name in the temple. If God wanted you to know that I got thumbs up for you, he put his name on you. There was the, the angel of the Lord. We knew it was something special because God put his name in the angel. Wherever God's name was, it said his presence was there. Wherever his name is named, there he is. Um, there, 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 the verse about baptism. This is exactly what we're talking about here today. Is you know, you understand his name. You know it's beginning to change your life when you begin to gather in his name. Because where you gather, there is presences. It marks where his presence is. What does the Bible say? Where two or more are gathered. 
in his name. There he is, right in the middle, right in the midst. Matthew 18, 20, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them, in the name of Jesus. What verse were we looking at earlier? For those that are baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Baptized in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Right? We do that all the time. Baptism is a community idea. Did you know that? You're not baptized because it's what you're supposed to do, but you're baptized into a community. You're baptized into a body. That's why you get baptized. That's why people are around. That's why people are cheering. That's why we do it in front of people to say, hey, I belong to Jesus. Jesus belongs to me. Right? Baptism is a community where you're joining the community of believers. And when you join a community of believers, you become a part of God's tangible presence and things begin to change because where two or more are gathered, all of a sudden there he is inside his presence. And that's the life we need to live. You see, God never designed you to do life alone. God never designed you to do life alone. And if you're doing it that way, you're doing it wrong. And, and you know, God bless all of us introverts. Us, me, I'm an introvert, believe it or not. And God bless us all. But if you slip into church and you slip out, you're missing it. it nothing against all the people in the back. But if, you're, but if you're a backseat sitter, man, you need to, on the way out, begin to in, introduce yourself to people. Look, if you've been going to church for more than a year and you don't know anybody, come on, get out yourself. Get into the business because I need you just like you need me. And when we begin to do this thing together, where two or more are gathered, there he is in the middle of that. So if you need change in your life, maybe you need to look at your community. Because God's name is looking for a place to be. God's presence wants a place to be, but he's looking for a community to land in. What are you gathering around? When you gather, who are the people? You see, churches, church, look, you don't come to church just for Jesus. Wait, listen, hold on a second, hold on a second, hold on a second. That's a big part of it. But, but you, you can hear a message anywhere. We live in the technological age. You could, you could live stream it, you could uh, unlive stream it. I don't know. You, know. you can listen to podcasts, you can get a message anywhere. But the one thing you can't get from that internet interaction is the community of believers. God tells us to gather. Why? Not just because you need something to do on a Sunday morning or a Sunday night or a Wednesday or a Thursday or whatever, because God wants to land someplace in a community of believers and make a difference in the world around him. This is necessary for us to make a difference because I need you and you need me because me alone, I'm only a one. I don't need a one, I need a two or a three or I don't know, maybe a couple hundred. And when we can get together, then all of a sudden it's like a concentration of the power of God that can move mountains. What happened when the believers gathered together? The house was shaken. The spirit poured out. Hey, Peter, who was in prison, began to move miraculously, and the angels came to save him because the believers were gathered together. You can't get that out of a podcast, man. God bless it. I love it. But you need a community of people around you so his name can land and rest in a place of com communal faith to make a difference in the world around you. This is why we do this. Not just because we got nothing to do tonight, but because I need to believe for the miraculous in my life. Because you need me to believe for the miraculous in your life. And something happens when we're all in one accord and we're singing stories about who God is and we're making a difference and heaven takes notice. The Holy Spirit begins to move in us, through us, and around us. And maybe God's putting a word in your heart so you can tell you. And maybe God's telling you to like, give somebody a hug. And maybe God's putting a word. Look, 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 look. This is not a consumer Christianity. I'm going to the grocery store because I need a little bit of this and a little bit of that. No, no. This is a place where we Commit, com commit to each other. Who's sad because we can be sad with you? Who's happy so we can rejoice with you? Who has a need because maybe you need what I got? And now all of a sudden we begin to be a community of people that are giving and taking and receiving and giving and taking and receiving. Because maybe you need a turkey dinner and I already got one but I can afford to get you one. And that's why we're doing this because that's what happens in community. Because the name of God desires, God's presence looks to land, to become active in a body of believers. We're all a part of the body. The body only works together when it is together. Each and, each and every one of us, look, look, I know you got the Holy Spirit living on the inside of you, but, 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 the, but Paul the Apostle says, you're like a brick. 
that goes next to my brick. And together, we make a temple. Together, we make a place where God wants to rest. So it's not just about the individual. It's about all of us coming together and sharing life together. That's what communion is. When we do the little bread and the juice thing, that's not just because we like bread and juice. Because if that was the case, I want more. Okay? It is not satisfying. I want dinner. It's not about the bread and the juice. It's about me and you coming together and thinking one thing and saying, I believe. I believe God's got the answer for you. You see, God's name desires us. It means for us to gather because God's name means his presence. And his presence is looking for people, plural, to make a difference. I remember um, oh, about 12 years ago, I went to Russia for some reason. I was on this mission trip. Um, we were in the middle of nowhere. Russia's a big place, you know. And they ended up, somebody ended up convincing me to go preach at this little village with about a team of like 12 young adults and teenagers. And we jumped in this weird looking car and we just drove forever, like hours, in the middle of nowhere. And I thought, I hope I make it home. <laughs> and after a couple hours of driving into the forest, we end up at this place that looked like a, looked like a, like a storage, I don't know, it was like a, like a storage location. And we walked over to this big metal container. And there's a door in it. So I was like, I've seen at least three movies where this ends bad. <laughs> so I walk in, we, we all walk into this little metal building and there's stairs that are like this. And we go down like a flight of stairs and, the, and I walk through the door, I'm like, oh, this is a church. <laughs> in the middle of this little basement. So there's about 50 of us there, ah, 50 or 60 of us there, and the band begins to do the thing. They got this dude on the, uh, on, the, on the keyboard just jamming, and out of nowhere, this one girl comes out with a flag spinning stuff, and I'm like, wow, Russians are crazy. <laughs> and it was in the middle of that worship set, about, I don't know, 7,000 miles away from home. It hit me, and I thought, I know this. I know this feeling. I felt this at youth camp. I felt this at my church. I realized this is the same God that I know at home. Yes. Uh, we had always said, Pastor Jan, we always said that you're never a stranger in your father's house. And I recognized thousands of miles away in the middle of this weird, creepy basement at this church in Russia, in Sohoi Log, Russia, that I was in my father's house. I didn't understand a single word of what they were saying. But I knew the presence. Yes. I knew the presence. And there God began to heal the broken and save the lost. He encouraged the downtrodden. And he told me, I'm going to make it home. <laughs> because when you gather together, there's a unity. This is why we have to be in unity, Joe. This is, there's a unity that God can land his presence on. So God's desire is that we would represent his reputation, that we would create a place for his presence to do the miraculous, but also for his authority. And when you recognize that there's authority in the name of Jesus, you begin to trust him. You begin to trust God when you recognize that there's authority in the name of Jesus. Because when he speaks, things change. What, 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 did it say in, what did it say in Philippians? It said, it, 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 it said, therefore God has highly exalted Jesus. He put him way up high. He bestowed on Jesus the name that is above every name. So the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, that every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, the glory of the Father. All of a sudden what happens is you see that this name is better than every other name that is out there. I mean, think of it. Think of, think of all the names that are out there. Think of all the issues and labels that are out there. And Jesus' name is right there at the top. When he says something, it means something's about to change. There's authority in what he says. You may not see the power immediately. It may not look what you, like what you want it to look like. But when he speaks, I'm going to tell you this. It happens. You see, when a higher up gives a direction, then that means every subordinate's directions don't matter anymore. Right? right. Well, my, my middle manager told me this, oh, but the boss said. But dad told me, but mom said. <laughs> right? 
We know whose word supersedes everybody else's word. And you hear this every day. You, you tell it to yourself sometimes. You look in the mirror, or you, you, you step on the scale, all of a sudden you, you open your email, you open up your bills, and all of a sudden voices begin to, begin, to, begin to tell you. These names begin to declare their news over your news. But when you recognize that God gave Jesus, the Father gave Jesus a name that is above every other name, and if he has authority, then when he speaks, then every other report you've heard all of a sudden begins to be superseded by the name and the authority and the words that Jesus has spoken. You begin to recognize, you begin to recognize, and you have, if you have a hard time realizing, that's okay, because you're gonna gather together and create a place for the name to bring the authority into that situation. It's gonna happen because you know the reputation of who God is, because every time he said it, he's done it. When he did it for me, he'll do it for you. All of a sudden, I've got, I, I've, I've got no less than 6,000 plus years of reputation banking on how good my God is. That every time he should have gave up on somebody, he didn't. That every time somebody was unfaithful to him, oh, I, he has a reputation for being faithful to the unfaithful. He has a reputation for healing the broken. He has a reputation for supplying the need to all those who have need. His reputation, when all of a sudden we begin to get next to each other and begin to Remind each other of how good his reputation is, brings the authority of God into the place, into the situation, and things begin to change. Yes. Because the name holds authority. When Jesus speaks, it happens. His word supersedes whatever that label on your prescription says. His name supersedes whatever that pink slip has dictated about your financial future. His name supersedes whatever the fertility report from the doctor gave you. His name supersedes whatever the report card reports on last semester's grades. It supersedes it because it, just because you were an F student doesn't mean you have to be an F student. Just because, just because somebody called you stupid don't mean you got to be stupid, okay? Because, what has, because when you recognize what God has spoken over you, his word changes things. So even, even if you know it's true, it's factual about you, that's okay. Because I just got to hear the word, and God's word changes my situation into what he says it ought to be. Yeah, let me read this. Let me read this, and we'll shut this thing down. Exodus 22. This is a crazy one. Exodus 22. Um, Exodus 22, it's just... It, it's a story where God's talking to Moses, and God says, Moses, I got good things for you. We're going to go to the promised land. He says, God, God says, Moses, we're, we're going we're, we're to make history. We're going to do great things. I have, I, have, I have ideas that go beyond your wildest dreams. I'm going to take you to the promised land. There's going to be some battles. It's going to be ugly, but I got you. He says, my presence is going to go before you, his name. He says, behold, I'm sending an angel before you, capital A, angel, before you to keep you in the way and bring you, Moses, bring you and your people into, into the place that I have told you about. Into the place that, I like this, I have prepared. Now beware of this angel. Beware of my presence, of him, capital H, M. Obey his voice and do not provoke him. He will not pardon your transgressions. My name is in him. My authority, my presence, my reputation. But if you indeed obey his voice and do all that I speak, then I will be an enemy to your enemies. Ooh, when you've got the right person on your side, you can do anything, and you can talk a mean game of smack. Because that's, that's half the fun of doing sports, right, is a smack talk. And then I will be an enemy to your enemies and an adversary to your adversaries. If God promised it to you, he's going to go there before you. God always gets there first. That's how you know if you go someplace and he's not there, you're too early. You don't belong there. He said, I'm going to go before you and prepare the way. His authority, his authority changed the situation. His presence was there to receive him. And his reputation, his reputation was being strengthened in your heart. So when you begin to forget, you remember how good it is to be 
called a Christian, to be called by the name of Jesus. Look, 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 look. God has a reputation and it's good. God has a presence and it's available. God has authority and it's working on your behalf. So today, if you've ever felt insignificant, that's okay because you don't got to rest on your name and your reputation. You don't got to rest on your authority. You don't got to rest on your presence because maybe you're not strong enough. Maybe you feel like people don't listen to you. That's okay because the one who does listen to you is greater than all the people that have been ignoring you. So if you'll honor his name and take it as your own, say, I'm going to live in Jesus' name. I'm going to live in an honorable way. I'm going to gather my friends. I'm going to gather my people, and we're going to create a place for him to rest in church, after service. When I need somebody, I need to call him on the phone. I'm going to create a place for God to do the miraculous with his authority. Hey, today, if you've got somebody I've got today, let's give him a praise. Isn't it good? Isn't it good to be in the house of God? Isn't it good to be with people that if you're down, they're up to pick you up? This is why we gather, to be reminded of the goodness of God. Hey, tonight, let's do this. This whole, this whole evening was about taking the name in honor, not vain. I, I want 